Chapter 3 Master Sarkan wants you to eat with him tonight, Erekin said as Jackin came into the bond house. His smile turned what must have been a command into an invitation, but he delivered it with the half-bow, half-bob he had affected ever since Jackin had bought his bond. Dinner at his house. Fumits, muttered Jackin. I wish you'd stop that bowing. It embarrasses me. Erekin shrugged and bobbed again, almost imperceptible this time. But I like doing it he said, still smiling. I like showing you how I feel. After all, you promised to buy my bond from Master Sarkhan when you had enough gold, and you did. I bow because I'm grateful. They say a good master makes a grateful servant, so you must be a good master. He paused and added, And you pay me more for less work. Because I want you to pay off your bond and be free, but you just spend it every chance you get, Jacob said his voice lowering to a near growl, or bet it stupidly. He stopped himself from mentioning that he actually had very little money to spare, what with feed costs and pit fees. Erekin would consider such talk unmasterly. If he could only get Erekin to buy off his bond or let Jackin simply manumit him, set him free. But Erekin sidestepped the issue with a smile whenever he brought it up. That smile and that constant good humor annoyed Jackin. He snapped, I keep telling you, don't spend your gold. Save it for freedom. Why? I don't want to be free. Erekin smiled more broadly. I'm perfectly happy with you as my master. I know you'll never let me starve. I get room and food and gold in my bag. What more do I need? Jackin was silent. What more? When he was a bonder, all he had ever wanted was to own a dragon and be free. Erekin somehow wanted neither of those things. All these years they had worked together, side by side, as bonders in the nursery, eaten together in the dining room, slept in the same bunk bed. It seemed incredible to Jackin that they could be so different, want such different things. His hand went to the bag under his shirt, and he made a face. For the whole of the past year, Erekin had argued against Jackin's wearing a bag. It doesn't master, lady, he complained, but this time he ignored Jackin's gesture. You've been with that dragon all night. Let's get you cleaned up. He gestured with his hands in a shooing movement toward the corridor. Jackin nodded distractedly and marched down the hall. Only as he turned into a single room did it occur to him that sometimes he seemed the bonder and Erekin the master. So quickly did he jump to Erekin's tomb. As a free man, Jackin no longer had to share quarters with the others. Although he knew it was a privilege, he often missed his friends, missed having someone to talk with just before falling asleep. But when he saw Erekin coming toward him with a washcloth, he remembered the one advantage to having his own room. He could throw someone out of it. He held up his hand. No, he said. I'm perfectly able to clean myself. I'm not a child, you know. His voice was sharp. All the contentment he had felt with the dragon had been leached away by Erekin's smiling attentions. But I like helping you, Erekin said, his bland, handsome face set in its smile. Out, said Jackin. Now, Master Jackin, Erekin said, out, as you wish. Erekin left, bowing, his face triumphant. By the time the door shut, Jackin was as angry with himself for the outburst as he was with Erekin. He hated losing his temper and sounding like an outraged old master. He had certainly seen enough of them at the pits. They screamed and hit their bonders at any provocation. Jackin had a sneaking suspicion that Erekin wouldn't mind a smack now and then. But if he had to become that kind of master, he wanted nothing to do with the bond system at all. Jackin bit his lip and calmed down by forcing himself to take stock of his room, an old trick that usually worked. This time, though, the neatness of the place, all Erekin's doing, annoyed him anew. He ticked off the bonder's additions to his Spartan surroundings, a bone pitcher filled with con reeds, the fax badges and tickets from three minor fights arranged on a board by the door, a bowl of jingle shells from Sucre's Marsh. There was nothing wrong with any of them. In fact, they were quite handsomely displayed. But he preferred doing such things on his own. I fill my bag myself, he murmured. That was something his mother had taught him before she died, and it was something he believed in. Having Erekin, or anyone else, tidying up after him, toadying up to him, annoyed Jack and almost beyond the telling of it. He set to scrubbing off the accumulated barn dirt with a ferocity that left him no energy to think about Erekin, or any other petty annoyances. The dining room was full and noisy. 
Jack had made his way to the table where the younger boys, Slack, Erican, Trico, and Larrick, sat eating. At his arrival, Erican jumped up subserviently, and Jack had rolled his eyes toward the ceiling. Sit down. Yes, master, Erican said. Yes, master, the boys all mimicked, further embarrassing Jack and, but not seeming to bother Erican at all. A girl laughed at another table. Jack and did not look to see who it was. Done, Slack asked. All done, Jack and said. He grimaced as Erican slid a glass of hot, thick tack in front of him, but drank it nonetheless, hunger getting the better of indignation. But he reached quickly for a pair of boiled lizard eggs before Erican could serve him. Trico slid the basket of bread down the table toward him, and he nodded his thanks. Now we wait for the hatchlings to come out. How long? Slack began. Jack and shrugged. When they come. Slack smiled and pushed away from the table, rocking back on the hind legs of his chair. When they come. I know, I know. Don't lecture me. The dragon chooses the time. Haven't I heard that before? I just don't have the patience for worm farming. When I can buy out a bond, I'm moving to the city. I'll own a stew bar. Or a baggery. The boys laughed. The lad broke. Sampling your own wares, warned Lyric. But what a way to go, Slack answered quickly, his dark, ferrety eyes lighting up. I want to be a senator, Trico said, and live in a big house in the Roke, and have people wait on me and wash my clothes and have more to eat than lizard meat and talk and eggs and bread and... Pah, boy, said Crick, one of the farmhands, as he passed by the table, two platters of lizard meat carefully balanced. Who ever heard of a senator who smells of the farm? Even Master Zarkan knows better than to make a run for it. They'd sniff you out. Why would you want to be a senator anyway? Overbred, underprincipled, soft-handed warden brats. It was Balak. Overhearing the boys, he had come to their table to continue the old argument. He folded his arms over his chest, and the muscles on his forearms bulged. To be a senator means being for the Federation, a pawn of the Galaxian Empire. And I say that, he spat on the floor, for the Baslime Fetters. Lyric and Trico slammed their mugs on the table. Better no! Better no! They chanted loud enough to be heard throughout the room. Pots and pans clattered suddenly in the kitchen. Karina, the only one at the farm who openly supported the Federation, was angry. No one, not even Sarkhan, whom she worshipped, could change her mind. She was convinced that if Ostar joined the Federation, she would be able to purchase all the materials she needed to modernize her kitchen and generate reliable electric power. The boys chanted louder, Slack and Erican joining in, hoping to make Karina storm out of the kitchen and shake a spoon at them. The older bonders watched the kitchen door in silent amusement. They liked Karina, but they loved her wild displays as well. This time, the only indication of her political displeasure was the rattling of pans. The ineffective chanting slowly died. Slack's voice was the last to be heard. Only Jackin, of the boys, had been silent, methodically chewing the tough eggs and sipping the spicy tack. He hated dinner table politics. It was all slogans and no sense. He knew that membership in the Federation would mean Ostarians would have to conform to Galaxian rules and Galaxian laws instead of their own. They would be ruled by a Federation-selected governor instead of the loose system of country senators. The Federation definitely outlawed a master class, and Jack and secretly thought that would be just fine. But it didn't prohibit a class of rich hereditary overlords, which meant, he thought, that you had to be born into it. Like most Ostarians, Jackin was fiercely independent, a legacy of his convict ancestors. If there was bond, well, a boy could always buy his way out, but you couldn't change your birth. Maybe Karine is a secret rebel, whispered Lyric. Maybe she's plotting to put something in our stew. Slack guffawed, slapping Lyric on the back. Balak's face turned purple. You piece of worm, Donald, he called. What did you say? Karina, a rebel. That gal couldn't sneak about if she wanted to. He had meant it as a compliment to Karina's honesty, but they all took it as a measure of her vast girth and laughed. Lyric laughed the loudest, his boy's voice cracking on the highest note, and Balak, realizing he was being teased, shut up. Jack and thought about the rebels. What few of them there were wanted neither system, no masters, but no federation either. But they offered nothing to put in its place. Every week, the rebels littered the pit fights with pamphlets, badly written stuff full of slogans, all of which Jack and found stupid, especially since most bonders, at whom the pamphlets were aimed, couldn't read. 
He stood up, taking the tack cup with him. Once these political games started at the table, they went on until chore time, and were boring and predictable. Federation, rebels, senators, the whole lot could rot and fume it as far as he was concerned. He was a dragon master, and would rather talk about the changing of the seasons and the raising of dragons, the price of wart seed and the bloodlines of worms. He left the room.